Hello, I'm Stuart Preston, and this is the Consciousness Podcast, where each week I have a conversation with an expert in human consciousness. This week, I had the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Keith Frankish, a European philosopher and writer. I was first introduced to Dr. Frankish's theory by David Chalmers' keynote speech at the Science of Consciousness. The theory is illusionism. Do we have consciousness, or does it seem as if we have consciousness? Dr. Frankish is an honorary reader at the University of Sheffield, a visiting research fellow with the Open University, and an adjunct professor with the Brain and Mind program at the University of Crete. His focus is primarily in philosophy of mind, but he has interest in many areas of philosophy. Please enjoy this conversation on illusionism with Dr. Keith Frankish. Oh, and there's a bonus far out question at the end on illusionism's potential role in the brain as a portal to a greater consciousness. I came away from that conversation with a new perspective. Again, please enjoy this edition of the Consciousness Podcast with Dr. Keith Frankish. That does just kind of lead me straight into our mm. first question, if you're ready yeah, to sure. go. Let's go. Okay, so um, so when when did you come into illusionism itself, and, and how did you get there, being, being a, what you described yourself as a, a materialist? Right, well... Shall I begin by saying what, what illusionism is, first of all? Please, um, please. Uh, so let's take something, some phenomenon um, that is strange and difficult uh, to explain. Let's say you've had an experience of something that seemed supernatural, paranormal. Maybe you've mm-hmm. seen someone who claims to have telekinetic powers. They can make things they can move things by the power of the mind alone. And they, show, they give you a demonstration of this, and it looks very convincing. And they seem to be able to make things by the spoons, bend, or whatever it is, just by the power right. of their mind. Now, there's, broadly speaking, there are three attitudes you can take to that. One is you can say, well, look, this, this is real. This person was really bending these spoons by the power of their mind. And there's no way science as we know it can explain that. This is a whole new phenomenon here. Uh, we're going to need to appeal to perhaps some kind of new kind of physical laws uh, to explain this, or maybe it's, there's some supernatural powers here. So it's real and not explainable within current um, science. Another attitude you might take is to say, well, yes, it's real. He, this person really was bending these spoons, but I think we can explain it within existing scientific theories. So maybe there was, <laughs> I don't know how you do this, but maybe there was some sort of... A, that he was channeling some kind of electromagnetic forces or something through his fingers. Right. And then the third option is to say, it's not real. Um, This person was doing something, but it wasn't actually bending spoons by the power of their mind. It was a trick. Uh, Maybe they bent the spoons surreptitiously with 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 their fingers and they made it look as if they were bending them with the power of their minds. They were doing something, but it wasn't what it seemed to be. It was an illusion. And now, just in those cases, those three cases, you have something quite different to explain in the different cases. In the first two cases, you're accepting that what was happening was real. It really was psycho, um, psychokinesis. Mm-hmm. The phenomenon was, and that's what you've got to explain. In the third case, you don't have to explain psychokinesis. It didn't happen. You have to explain the illusion of psychokinesis. Why? seemed that this person was bending spoons by the power right. of them. So we need to explain your responses, your reactions, your perception. Now, let's transfer that to consciousness. Again, consciousness seems strange and mysterious. When we introspect, when we kind of look into our own minds, it seems that our experiences have this inner quality, this subjective feel, um, mm-hmm. which doesn't seem to be explained by what's going on in the brain. It seems that these brain processes that are going on, uh, processing information, maybe doing computations on that information, guiding responses, they could all go off without this subjective feel, without this what it is likeness, the way it feels on the inside to you. And this seems very mysterious. And so here we, again, we have one of these kind of anomalous phenomena. And again, there are three positions you can take. You can say, yes, it's real. It's just what it seems to be, this mysterious, this, this inner subjective world, it's real. And we can't explain it with an existing uh, 
science, with neuroscience and cognitive psychology. We, we can't right. do that. We need to appeal to something new, perhaps to some new physical laws, perhaps to something entirely non-physical. Second option is to say, yes, it's real, but we can explain it with, within existing science, within the, with the resources of cognitive science as we have it, um, perhaps in terms of information processing um, and uh, the, our ability to represent our own mental processes in some way uh, gives them this feel. Right. And then the third option is to say, well, actually, it's, it's not real. It seems that there's this mysterious inner world that is something more than all the information processing that's going on there. But that's an illusion. That's an introspective illusion. It's a feature of how we think about our own minds. There's, there's something going off, certainly, but it's not what it seems to be. It's not this kind of mysterious, ineffable, intrinsic feel. And that's illusionism. So again, so how did you get to that, that point of believing that it's an illusion as opposed to real? Initially, I was. I, I think that the, the mainstream position, certainly the mainstream position when I was uh, at graduate school, was, was the middle one, the second one. It's real. We're, we're realists about phenomenal consciousness, but we can explain it with, with existing uh, resources. And so there are theories, representational theories of consciousness, for example, uh, which try to explain it in terms of our representations of the world and perception or in terms of our representations of our own experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was, I guess I was, I was identified myself with that sort of position. But then I think um, I was actually quite persuaded by some of the arguments were saying, no, that doesn't work. I, in 1996, in the mid-90s, David Chalmers, um, I'm sure you, uh, your listeners will have heard of, 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 mm -hmm. of his book, The Conscious Mind, in which he right. articulated the hard problem, and he set out some arguments, powerful arguments, for thinking that consciousness couldn't be explained in those terms. And I kind of thought those were, those were quite, quite persuasive. Mm -hmm. But I didn't want to give up on the idea. I didn't want to, 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 to throw my lot in, as it were, with the with the, um, what I call the radical realists, the ones who want to propose some, some, uh, uh, some, some new, um, I want to appeal to new. Some brand new explanation. New kinds of explanation. Uh, so the other way to go, if you think that it can't be explained in physical terms, but that the brain just is ultimately a very complex physical mechanism is to say, well, it must be an illusion then. So, um, if you think that, to take the analogy with spoon bending, if you think that that couldn't be explained in, uh, uh, in scientific terms, uh, and you don't want to propose, you don't want to go with the idea that it's supernatural, then the obvious position is to say that it's, it's a trick of some sort. And at the same time, I'd been very influenced by Daniel Dennett's uh, book from a few years earlier, Consciousness Explained. I've always been a fan of Dennett's. I've always seen myself as a kind of disciple of his and mm. he for many years has been uh, arguing for a position that he, um, he didn't always call it illusionist but it, 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 he, he likened consciousness to an illusion and he denied that qualia the, the name for these this these, these mis sort of mysterious properties that our experiences seem to have that they he denied that they existed and i'd always been very influ very strongly influenced by him even while i was still a sort of uh, mainstream realist. And so putting those two right. things together uh, led me where I am now. I'm not, uh, I should say that I'm not hostile to people exploring other options, including radical options. But I think this one's an important option and that it needs to be given more consideration, I think, taken more seriously than it has been. Yeah. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And it's, in, in reading through it, it, it seems as though you've also described something of uh, you your your own problem, the illusion problem. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, as I said, if you take this this third view, then this changes the nature of what needs to be explained. You no longer need to explain consciousness in the um, in the traditional sense. You need to explain why it seems to us that we have consciousness in that sense. So it's yeah. a different problem. You know that heart. This 
illusionism doesn't answer the hard problem. It says there isn't a hard problem. Uh, yeah, that, no problem. that's interesting. So what that, what that is the problem? The problem is explaining the illusion, why it seems that there's a hard problem. And Chambers himself um, um, agrees that there is a that, that we need to explain why it seems to us that there's this problem, even if you think there is a problem as well. He calls it the the meta problem, the problem of why we think there's a problem. Yeah, were were you at the uh, the science of consciousness event in Tucson? I wasn't. No, unfortunately. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's. Uh, because that's what his presentation was about mm-hmm. is uh, the, the, me- the meta discussion of the hard problem. Mm-hmm. And I, I did think it was interesting. He presented, you know, a lot, a lot of the, the theories of consciousness. And that's when, when you came up, mm-hmm. you know, he brought up illusionism and he showed your book. And so mm-hmm. that's initially how I came across, you know, you and your studies, but you're, you're right. He said, well, if you believe in illusionism, then there is no hard problem. You have mm-hmm. a completely different problem that you need to pursue. Mm-hmm. Exactly, and that's the that's the only problem. From David's perspective, I think he he thinks there is um, there, there certainly is a heart problem. There is the, the first order problem, but there still is this meta problem because he thinks that um, it's very likely that all our beliefs about consciousness and our judgments about consciousness, and our reports about consciousness, can actually be explained without mentioning consciousness, since the since he thinks these are likely to be the product of physical processes in the brain. Um, and if you think that consciousness is non-physical, uh, and if you think that non-physical properties don't sort of have any effect in the physical world, which is another quite a plausible claim, then you're left with the conclusion that our beliefs about consciousness and our reports about consciousness are not actually caused by consciousness. Um, and this is what he called the paradox of phenomenal judgment. And so you have this quite a separate explanation of why, we're, why we say we're conscious, which is separate from the explanation of why we are conscious. So, that, so David has two problems, the hard problem and the, the meta problem. Um, I just have the second one because I deny that we are conscious in that sense. If you look at traumas, teen traumas about the zombie problem, right? And so I guess if you look at consciousness as being an illusion, um, does that mean you're a zombie or is it good enough that you, you seem to be having these uh, phenomenal experiences enough to make it that you're not a zombie? Well, and I asked that on. almost a little in jest because he got a lot of questions about the zombie problem. And so it's, it's you know, just I'm throwing that out there as, as something that maybe you thought about. In a, tech, in a certain technical sense, I'm quite happy to say that I am a zombie. If a zombie is understood <laughs> to be, uh, if a zombie is a person, uh, is a creature that is a, an exact duplicate of me minus the phenomenal properties, then that's no different from me because I don't have any phenomenal properties. Okay. So in that, right. te- that technical sense, I'm a zombie. Now, if that's one way of describing what a zombie is. Another way, more uh, uh, sort of expressive ways to say a zombie is a creature that has no inner life. It's all dark within. It's kind of like a robot. Mm -hmm. I I, I don't agree with any of that. I have awareness of all sorts of things that are going on in my mind. Uh, I can tell when I'm in certain mental states, when I'm, uh, when I'm in pain, when I'm seeing something, uh, uh, when I'm seeing the blue sky outside my window and I'm smelling coffee, I can, I can tell this introspectively. Uh, so I have this inner life, and it seems very rich to me. What I'm denying is that it involves awareness of phenomenal properties in the sense in which those uh, are usually defined as something that can't be captured in functional terms that aren't just a matter of a whole bunch of reactions and dispositions and associations and so on. Right. So in the strict sense, yes, I'm a zombie. In the broader common sense sense, and of course I'm not. Okay. Well, I am honored. You're, you're the first zombie that I've interviewed, so that's I, I appreciate that. Um, so then let's let's dive a little bit deeper into that then, because one of the things that I saw you wrote, and see if I can get all these words out so that they make sense. But you mentioned that f- the quality of the phenomenal properties are illusory, as you've mentioned, and that we have only a subset of distorted information 
required to really understand the phenomenal experience and that we misrepresent those experiences. Um, so I was hoping you could explain some of that. This, you know, all, the, all these words, you know, that we're only getting a subset of information, that the information is distorted and that we misrepresent these experiences as you're kind of describing the, the illusory experience. So how is it distorted in, in a subset and misrepresented to us? Okay, let me say at the start that illusionism, as I've defined it, is a negative thesis. It's saying these, these properties that philosophers in no, particular no. like to talk about. Don't say, now then there's, there's going to be a positive side to that, explaining, uh, uns- uh, solving the illusion problem. And there are many different ways to go on that, many different accounts of what the illusion is, how it's created, and so on. And I haven't staked out a particular uh, claim within that. In fact, one the thing that I'm trying to do at the moment is to provide a taxonomy of possible illusionist positions. And there's quite a large field here that I think is relatively mm-hmm. unexplored. So I'm not committed to defending a particular form of illusionism, uh, just the general thesis. Now, look, um, here's what, look, I'm, I suppose I'm, 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 si- I'm sitting right now and looking at the, at, the, at the blue sky out of my window. Now, what's happening? Well, light rays are, are, are hitting my retinas. Uh, uh, Neural impulses are traveling to my brain, and whole vast swathes of electrochemical activity are happening in my brain. Right. And when we understand at a low level quite well what's going on there with neurons firing and neurotransmitters working and so on, how it all adds up is a much, much, much bigger problem. But, but I assume that in principle a neuroscientist, Mary perhaps in her black and white room, could understand all this. Now, we, as, as it were, users of our brains, don't understand all that. All we know is that we're seeing the sky, or whatever it is. Right. Now, suppose we, we, were, we were equipped with a kind of neuroscience laboratory in our own heads, and we, could, we had a sort of neuroscope, and we could turn it in on ourselves and see everything that was happening there, and see all this activity and all its wonder and complexity. Then... I don't think we'd be puzzled by what's happening. We'd say, well, look, I can see what's happening. The light rays are hitting my eyes. And then there's this amazingly complex um, uh, 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 patterns of activity in, 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 my, in my visual cortex and in the other parts of my brain and so on. It's producing all these reactions, all these responses and dispositions and readinesses to act and so on. And yeah, that's what's going off. And that disposes me to say the things that I do and so on. But we don't have that. We have a very limited sort of understanding of what's going on in our own minds. We can recognize what sort of mental state we're in. We can recognize not just that we're, we, we can react not just to objects in the world, but to our own mental states. We can think about what we're experiencing. We can report what we're experiencing. We can hide what we're experiencing from other people. Um, so we have some kind of introspective abilities but they are very limited. We're kind of peering into this, this vast computational machinery and just getting a, a kind of vague shadowy idea of what's happening in there. Uh, Dan Dennett likes to liken it to the user interface on a computer, on a, uh, uh, the, the desktop interface on a, on a computer screen. It's got little mm-hmm. icons and things and a waste basket and these everyday objects that we kind of recognize and we know how to manipulate if you put something in the waste basket basket is deleted. Now, those do correspond to things that are happening in the central processor and the, the RAM and the hard disk of your computer, but only in a very, very schematic way. Uh, you couldn't, you know, if you ask where exactly is the, the waste basket inside the circuitry, it's not there. There is a complicated information processing operations that correspond to it, but only in a very uh, abstract way. And that, he thinks, is what introspection is like, that it's a a schematic, distorted, very partial representation of our own mental processes. And it's so simple and um, schematic that we tend to, when we're asked to describe it, we say things like, well, I, I don't know, it's just, it's just this, 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 this feel, I'm just, it's kind of ineffable, it's, it's this intrinsic, what it's likeness. That's all we can say. We're just up at the limits of, of our ability to describe it. And we think that our, our limitation, our descriptive limitations there somehow correspond to some simplicity and um, uh, fundamentality in the thing we're describing. Uh, and that's why I say, that, that's why I think the illusion comes in, essentially, that we're, it's 
because we have such a partial representation of what's happening that we're tempted to think that there is something uh, that is similarly s uh, simple and fundamental and ineffable that's going on there. And so we tend to say things like, there's just this feel. So, yeah, that... and it's like, a, it's like the GUI interface. So the illusion is like the graphical interface that we, mm -hmm. we take as an experience, but there is so much going on that we, mm -hmm. we couldn't even process and understand. Exactly. And, and someone who's had no idea how a computer works might think, well, of course there's a waste basket. I just put something in it and it disappeared. Of course it is. <laughs> it's, right. Of course it's real. Um, and in a sense, it is. It's part of their experience of interacting with the, with, the, with, the, um, with the computer, and it's very useful to have it. But it's not, it's not, it's not a fundamental part of reality in the way that right. it's done. And, and, and that's kind of how I that's, – that's a rough analogy. Another analogy that uh, George Ray has is with a child who is watching a, um, a cartoon in a dark cinema, and – the child mistakes, uh, mistakes the cartoon creatures on the screen for, for real living, three-dimensional living creatures and wonders what happens to them when they go off the side of the screen and this sort of thing and how they yeah. can be. And so, uh, again, that's another analogy for introspection. It, and, and notice that that works, the, 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 the cartoon illusion works precisely because our visual system uh, is limited. We can't register each individual frame, so we see movement and we see life. Similarly, introspection is very limited, I think, and it creates illusions of simplicity and and sort of the, the, the rawness of these <laughs> raw feels, as, as, as they're sometimes called. Um, in a way, we're just gesturing. It, it, talk about phenomenality, I think, is more gesture at where we have an absence of of understanding an absence of information rather than uh, latching onto something positive that we are, are, are directly acquainted with there. We're just up at the limits of our, of our, of our understanding of our own interface with the world, if you like. Right. And even in those cases, sometimes the brain starts to fill in that information, even though mm -hmm. the information is not, not accurate and real. Absolutely. And uh, the, the, you know, there's a whole um, um, body of work on change blindness where people just don't notice that uh, the visual scene in front of them is changing. If they don't, uh, if they are fixated on a certain point, they, the, the, the scene around can change dramatically without them noticing it. But we, and in a way, the, the, the stability, the richness of our experience is, is itself an illusion. And in a way, illusionism just takes that a little bit further and says kind of the whole thing is a kind of construction too. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of that simple, the simplistic video you see on YouTube of people passing the basketball around and you focus mm -hmm. on the basketball and then the gorilla walks right through the screen and nobody notices mm -hmm. it. Exactly. And this is, this is what, uh, a point that's very central in, 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 in Dan Dennett's thinking about consciousness, we, that things only have a reality in consciousness if you notice them, if, you, if they somehow have downstream effects on your behavior. Um, mm. It has this example where a woman runs past you and she's, I think she's, she's not wearing uh, glasses, but she reminds you of, of a similar woman who did wear glasses and your memory and your experience, your memory of the experience becomes corrupted and you remember this woman you saw as wearing glasses. So there's been an interaction between perception and memory. Now, we can ask, but when you actually, when she, when she was running past, did you experience her with glasses or without glasses? Afterwards, you're, you're, you're completely sincerely, you say, no, she had glasses. But what was your, 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 your actual experience before it got corrupted? Can, can, we, can we pin that down? And Dennett's point is, well, no, because there are competing processes here. There's, there's information, there's the visual information that's coming in, there's the memory information. There are different interpretations of the scene and it doesn't make sense to say that one of them was the, 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 the determinate canonical one that got played in the theater of consciousness, decked out with these phenomenal properties, and the other one was just all in the dark. All that, all that we can really say is that one of them was the one that you're inclined to report now. That had, and if we'd asked you at a different time, you might have reported the other one. But it's, getting, it's having effects. It's being 
uh, registered in some way that makes something determinate. Before that, there's no determinacy to consciousness. And I think that's a, a, it's a difficult point to grasp, but I think it's, a very, it's an essential one. Uh, I think, a lot um, of implications to go with that. Lots of implications. I mean, here's one I like to think about. You, um, I guess we've all done this. You open the fridge and you're looking for something, say the, the, the jar of pickles, say, and you look and you, you just don't see it. And you close the fridge again. And you say to your partner, where are the, where is the, where are the pickles? And they're in the fridge. They're right there on the shelf. And you open it again and there they are. <laughs> and they're right yeah. there in front of you. And now there's a great temptation to think that if you could somehow spool back your experience and sort of inspect your experience again the first time, you would notice them there in your experience. There was somehow, <laughs> you, they were somehow there in your theater of consciousness, as it were, but you just didn't notice them. Well, right. now in some sense, uh, your brain was, must have been registering them, the, the light rays were bouncing off them and hitting your retina, but it just didn't get incorporated into your interpretation of what was there. And therefore, it just, they just weren't there for you. Um, there's no, there was no sort of inner, uh, inner sort of video recording of the experience that you could go back and look at. You can go back and look at the fridge and see what's there. And that's it. And you can go back and look at what you thought about the fridge that you thought they weren't there. That's all you've got. There's no intermediate record of the experience. But it's very tempting to think that there is. Yeah, it sure is. I, I you know, I had that experience as a, as a child. I was in Florida and we were in the Everglades and I looked down and I said to my family, Hey, look at that fish. And they, they said to me, Oh, you mean right next to that alligator? <laughs> and the alligator was not there, you know, and I don't know. I, and it's bothered me my entire life. Cause I thought, how did I not see this alligator? You I know, did I, did I make it into a log or did my brain just not even register it? And so it's, a, it's like the jar of pickles. The exactly. allig I couldn't replay it. I couldn't replay in my mind and say, Oh yeah, I just thought it was a log or whatever. It just, it wasn't there. And, and, and Dennett's point, of course, is that there's nothing to replay. There is just, there's just your reactions, your responses, your judgments, your, what, what you created out of the sensory information that was coming in. There, at some low level, probably, the, the other aspects of the scene were uh, registered. But if they didn't sort of incorporate them into your narrative about what you were seeing and experiencing, then that, that was it. They went, there was no show there there's no determinate kind of presentation of these uh, 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 images in some internal what, what then it calls right. the Cartesian theater it's very tempting to think that there must be because it's tempting to think that we are something other than our brains and that our brains as we produce um, you know create uh, uh, get the sense of information and they assemble it and they put it together and then they sort of show it to us uh, like a Cartesian soul communicating through the pineal gland and we kind of look at it and we can then inspect what our brain has shown to us as well as inspecting the world. And then it's point, and I agree totally with this, is that this is a, this is a, a very tempting but completely misleading picture. Yeah. And, so, and that we need to cast it out. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so, there's, so there's this line, it, it seems like, between... And maybe it's not even a line. Uh, you know, my, my own understanding is, is evolving as you and I talk. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I was thinking is there seems to be a line between, quote, seeming to have, you know, an experience, mm -hmm. illusionism, mm -hmm. and the, quote, what it is like to have, you know, experience realism. Mm -hmm. And if I understand, um, you know, to me, they're one and the same. I, mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm seeming to have it or if I'm actually having it, but... Mm -hmm. In your studies and your thought experiments or in your understanding of all this, do you see any kind of a, of a discovery that could actually break that line down and say, yes, everything is an illusion or actually it's all real? Is there something out there that you feel could be that, that mm -hmm. it would close that gap? Yeah. Before I answer that question, let me, uh, there's a sort of elephant in the room here, I think, which um, and I think it's probably useful to address it before I answer that question, Please. which is you were talking there about whether there could be a difference between how my consciousness seems to me and how it is. And for a lot of people, 
The answer is absolutely no. There can be no appearance, reality, distinction for consciousness. If it seems that I'm in pain, I am in pain. So the right. illusion is, is as much a, a fact of consciousness as the supposed uh, illusory um, uh, experience. And this sort of this is the, the usually the first and sometimes the, the, the last objection to illusionism, and it's one that uh, Galen Strawson describes illusionism as, a, I think he calls it the silliest view anyone's ever, ever advocated. Um, one that's so silly that only a philosopher could, uh, could, could possibly advocate. <laughs> right. um, he calls it the, the great denial. Um, and, uh, anyway, and, and you, there are many more examples of people. Um, right. Uh, saying how preposterous this view is. Now, I think there there is a preposterous claim here, but it's not the one I'm I'm making. Let me say what the preposterous claim is. Um, yeah. Uh, and partly it's it's caused by the word illusion. I, I do want to to stick with the word illusion. I think it's a useful one, but it does tend to lead to this this thought that the, to this objection that I've just mentioned. Normally, when you say that something's an illusion what you what you're experiencing the illusion what you mean is that you're in the same sort you're having the same kind of experience you would be having if the thing were real so if i'm having an, the illusion of uh say a white rabbit sitting on my desk then what i mean is i'm having the sort of experience i would be having if there really were a white rabbit sitting on my desk and i was seeing it right now, if you apply that model of illusion to consciousness, then you do get to something preposterous because you're saying, okay, uh, I'm having an experience that is exactly like the experience that I would be having if I were having a conscious experience of pain or whatever it is, or smelling coffee. Um, but I'm not having a conscious experience of pain or smelling coffee or whatever. But if I'm having an experience exactly the same as the one I would be having in that situation, then I'm having that experience. It's the same experience. Uh, right now uh, this uh, this particular analysis here that i'm drawing on is one that uh, french philosopher francois camera has uh, has um, set out quite nicely and yes if that's what i meant by saying that consciousness is illusory then i would be falling into that rather simple trap um but that's not what i mean i don't mean that i'm having when i say that consciousness is is an illusion that they I don't mean that I'm having an experience exactly the same as the experience I'd be having if I were having a conscious experience. Pretty obviously not. What I mean is that um, when we introspect, we seem to be aware of certain properties of our experiences, where experience there is characterized in a sort of information processing way. We seem to be aware of certain properties of our experiences, what call them qualia, phenomenal properties, whatever you want to call them, subjective mm -hmm. fields, raw fields, whatever, which are seem to be non-physical and uh, um, resist explanation in functional terms and so on. We tend to judge that our experiences have these properties. Perhaps we represent them as having those properties in some other way, uh, perhaps via some kind of introspective mechanisms, detector mechanisms, and they don't actually, and the, the, the mental states of the experiences don't actually have those properties. So it's quite coherent to say that we in some way represent our experiences as having certain properties that they don't have. Now, of course, if that representation itself involves having the same properties, if I was saying that my representation of my experience, my illusory representation of my experience, had the same phenomenal properties as I represent the experience as having, then I would be in a, going in a circle. But I'm not saying that. I don't think the representations have those, uh, have uh, themselves have phenomenal properties. They're not conscious experience. The experiences of our experiences are not themselves, certainly not phenomenally conscious experiences. Okay, so explaining consciousness, to put it simply, we're explaining consciousness in terms of non-conscious representations. So what it is to have what we call a conscious experience is to say non-consciously represent ourselves as being in some kind of state that has certain phenomenal properties. Or, alternatively, just to judge that one is in a state with those properties, to be inclined to believe it and to report it. So the point is, there are many ways of, of cashing out this notion of seeming that doesn't do so in terms of having conscious experiences of conscious experiences. So that's, I mean, it's, it, 
need spelling out a little bit more, but it's not making that very yeah. simple uh, circular argument. Um, it may be wrong. It may be, you may say, well, there's got to be a lot more to, being, to having what we call a conscious experience than just doing that. Maybe there has to be. But it's not incoherent to make the claim. It's not circular to make the claim. Okay, so to come back then to your question, your question was about whether we could determine, um, I, I guess, how we could decide between the realist positions uh, and the illusionist position, what sort of facts would tell us. Well, I think, suppose we developed a really good solution to the illusion problem or the meta problem. We, we, we've got this really nice account of why it is that we report that we're having experiences with this um, uh, phenomenal character, why we, why we think that we're phenomenally conscious. And we got a really good account of that, a really good explanation, which didn't actually mention consciousness itself. It didn't, it, it, the explanation didn't mention uh, any of these, uh, 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 didn't mention phenomenal consciousness itself. The explanation wasn't that we actually are phenomenally conscious and we've noticed it and therefore we're reporting it. It was that other processes lead us to believe that we're phenomenally conscious without our actually being so, or, or would lead us to report that we're phenomenally conscious even if we weren't so. Now, I think if we had that sort of explanation, then the temptation would be to think, well, that's all there is to it. If we would think that we were phenomenally conscious, even if we weren't, then what's the argument for thinking that we are? Um, it's a kind of debunking argument. If you can explain away, say, why people believe that, um, let's say, that, they're, that, 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 that the God is speaking to them, say, or that they've seen UFOs, or that they've had other parallel, paranormal experiences, if you can explain mm -hmm. all this without, supposing, without assuming the reality of the thing in question, then that's a kind of argument for not being a realist about the thing. It's, we've kind of debunked it. Um, so that would be a reason for, for, for favoring illusionism. Now, a reason for rejecting illusionism, I suppose, would be that you just can't come up with a solution to the illusion problem. Um, you can't explain why people uh, uh, believe that they're phenomenally conscious, why they have these intuitions about it, without supposing that it's real. So I think that a good question for everyone to focus on is, is the illusion problem, the meta problem, as, as Chalmers calls it. Because if we can solve that, it will certainly should give some weight to the illusionist side. And if we can't, it will definitely give weight to the uh, realist side. Also, we might find that even if we can solve it, we still have very strong intuitions that that's not all that's going off. And maybe then that would push us back towards realism. But solving that problem, I think, should be the first step for everyone. Yeah. Do you, do you think there's is actual, is it possible to solve that problem? I think so. Um, and this is one thing I'm, I'm trying to do is to, is to get people working on it. Um, yeah. It's, uh, it's not that this view that I'm, that I'm advocating is a new one. It's um, Daniel Dennett has been, has been um, proposing it for, for many years, and many other people have too. Uh, but it's often been regarded as a kind of marginal one that doesn't really take consciousness seriously. And so people have kind of, they've said, yes, it's interesting, but really, no, no, we, we, we want to take it seriously. And they've, they've steered away from it. I want to get people working on it, thinking about it, trying to develop yeah. illusionist theories, uh, because I think that's the way to go for everyone. Yeah, that, that would make sense. Mm -hmm. uh, if you think that's it good. Is I, I would expect a materialist to think that it would be solvable. I don't. I, that's one question I haven't asked other people. I guess I, I always kind of thought it was like one of those questions of well, why are we here rather than not here. I don't know if we're going to have an answer to the hard problem. But it's uh, it's interesting. You think that we can we can solve that? I mean, I I think we can. Um, certainly, working hypothesis and certainly. As Dan Dennett says, it's the should be the default hypothesis should be that consciousness is an illusion. Uh, hmm. If to go back to the uh, telekinesis, psychokinesis, um, the def the first option to explore is that it's a trick. Don't go off into speculation about uh, uh, new physic, new physical forces, and supernatural uh, powers and so on until you've established it's not a, just a, a mundane trick. Look at that right. first. Makes sense. Um, I think the interesting question would be, suppose we had a, a 
a complete so, and really convincing solution to the illusion problem. We could give a complete explanation of what of all our intuitions about consciousness, all our puzzlement about consciousness, everything we're kind of we're, all our introspective reports, not which didn't appeal at all to the reality of consciousness. And this was completely satisfying, and everybody was happy with it. Would we still want to say, yet I still trust the intuitions? I still, I have them, and you've explained why I have them. And you've shown me that I would still have them even if I weren't conscious, but I am conscious all the same. <laughs> um, I don't know, or would that explanation tend to erode our faith in the intuitions? Let's try and get the explanation. Yeah, so that's a good question. Because it, obviously this is all new to me, but I would, I would suspect even for my own good, I would say, yeah, I, I would trust my intuitions because I know that my brain is creating these illusions for my own good. There may be practical reasons for trusting them. It may be, it may be impossible for practical purposes not to, to, to trust them and kind of live by them. There may be illusions that... Yeah are essential to being human and interacting with each other in the way that we do. I'm, but my, quest, my question was more about whether we would trust them as science, as philosophy, as, uh, as an account of what is really there. It may be that there's a certain attitude we need to take to each other, which assumes this, um, uh, uh, sort of tacitly assumes the reality of this illusion. Um, right. and certainly, there are, uh, let me mention... Nicholas Humphrey um, in his uh, 2000 and 2011, I think, book, Soul, Soul Dust. That's an illusionist um, uh, approach. Now, I've tended to talk so far as if the illusion is just a kind of side effect of what our brains are doing in processing information, processing sensory information. It just happens that we have limited access to it and it kind of creates this kind of um, mistaken impression. And I think that's right. roughly Dennett's view. Now, Nick, um, in his book, takes a very different view. He thinks that this isn't just a side effect. This illusion is something that's actually designed in by evolution and that it's highly adaptive and has all sorts of benefits for us. Um, makes us relish uh, our own existence. It enriches our existence in many mm -hmm. ways. Um, it helps, it, it creates a sense of having a self and ultimately a soul. He doesn't believe in the uh, reality of the soul in a kind of metaphysical way, but he thinks that the soul is a kind of construction, a kind of um, invention, if you like. Uh, and it's a very, very important one. This is how we think of, conceive of ourselves, how we conceive of each other. We live, he says, in this, what he calls the soul niche, a kind of imaginative world in which each of us has this inner world, this spiritual being, and therefore infinitely valuable. And this is how we think of ourselves and how we think of other people. And this is very important to our social life, to our sense of our own lives, to the importance of our lives and so on. It is an illusion, but it's, a absolute, it's an absolutely um, um, essential illusion uh, for the kind of life, the kind of beings that we are. So yeah, because it's, uh, like you mentioned, enri enriching our lives. Mm -hmm, exactly. That, that so in the, positive experience. So in that, uh, from that perspective, establishing the truth of illusion, it, it wouldn't follow from that that we should give up the illusion. We might acknowledge right. that it is an illusion, uh, especially when we're doing science. And we certainly shouldn't start trying to develop scientific theories of consciousness as such, because we, we, we've accepted that it's an illusion. But it doesn't mean we should stop thinking of ourselves in those terms. Um, we can accept that this is not a wholly accurate picture, but it's still a valuable. So we could treat it like a, a kind of fiction or a, an imaginative landscape that we live in. Uh, and that we continue to live in. I don't yeah. think that the conclusion that we should strip away all this talk and, st and start thinking of ourselves in more mechanical terms, I don't think that follows from the illusionist claim. That, that, that's that's, a, that's a, a matter for um, how we live our lives. 
Uh, yeah, it's kind of like uh, when you, if if one would ever get to the conclusion that there is no free will, that doesn't mean just drop to the ground and stop acting. Exactly, and I take that the, the, this is 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 Dennis's point too. That uh, <laughs> of course we have all the free will that we kind of. It's not like we're actually constrained in some way, and it's not like accepting that say causal determinism holds in some way constrains us or stops us doing what we want to do. Uh, this is right. why people are compatibilists. They say, well, the, you know, yeah, okay, causal determinism holds, but that in no way interferes with my ability to make the sort of choices that I want and to live my life in the way that I want. Uh, and if I am constrained, it's for other reasons, not because I read this philosophy book. Um, so right. the, the, they're kind of these two sorts of talk, talk about causal determinism, talk about free, uh, uh, free action, I sort of exist in different, um, different levels, if you like, or from different perspectives. And they don't really um, uh, clash with each other, I don't think. I mean, you can right. build in some heavy metaphysical constraints on what it is to act freely, but I don't see why we should do that. And I think the same could go with talk about consciousness. We don't uh, have to sort of give it up. We just should just stop building in these heavy metaphysical commitments into it. Um, right, and I think that yeah, I think that makes that, sense. That's um, that's Nick's point, and I certainly would encourage anyone who's interested in this to read Nick's book. It's it's a lovely book. Yeah, I I will, I will definitely do so myself. <laughs> um, you you had mentioned you know Humphrey, and I guess one of the questions I had in thinking about this that the the consciousness enriches our lives. It adds these interests and these goals. Um, is that where ego starts to play, or, or the notion of self? you know, where that emerges? Um, is that something that, you know, you, you consider when you look at, at these, uh, you know, psychological concept of ego, you know, if, if illusion or illusions are designed to help us enrich our lives, yeah. is, is that kind of where the ego comes from? Absolutely. And that's a major theme in, in, in Nick's book. Uh, he thinks that the, 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 the sensation, the, um, the, 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 the this, this apparently magical realm of sensation is what creates our sense of having a self. We are, we are the, the, the self that experiences all these wonderful things. We are, as it were, like the, 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 the observer of this show, um, this magic show, as he thinks of it. And that creates the illusion the, the, there being a, a unified self there, a core self. And then we, we elaborate on this on this core self and build up the notion of an, of a, uh, an ego, a self, a soul that is uh, precious and that perhaps immortal. And, um, and so, so it's, it's, a, it's, again, it's a sort of, it's an invention. It's a constructive, a natural invention. It's not like mm. one that we've sat down and just thought, Oh, I will in, sort of, how about I imagine I've got a soul. It's, it's a very natural one for human beings to, 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 to have. And it's natural. Uh, Humphrey thinks because, evolution is designed us that way it's, it's it's evolution spotted that this was a this was a useful characteristic for humans to have it gave them greater interest in life it made them um, more um tenacious of life if you like and so it it, it fostered uh, the tendency to to um to, to elaborate this conception of ourselves and our um and our inner life and our immortal souls and so and uh, so yes, but, but, but read Nick's account of it because it's um, the, the book is uh, proceeds in stages, building uh, starting with the, the basic illusion and then building up um, to uh, and the different ways it enriches our lives and how we we build up this notion of the, the human soul from that. Hmm. Yeah, and you mentioned evolution, mm -hmm. and you know now now you're talking about how evolution, you know, would. We, we created our notion of self and our soul and, and how important that is to us. But I, fe I think I read in your writing somewhere that you said evolution could not set it up so that the brain states really have qualia. Mm -hmm. And um, so what, what did you mean by that? Did I, get, did I read that right? Did I get that quote right? I can't actually, can't actually remember the quote, but it sounds like the sort of thing I would say, so I'm happy to okay. it. <laughs> um, um, well, the thought is, look, if, if qualia are non-physical, as a lot of people think they are, and if the physical, if the physical world is, as philosophers say, causally uh, closed, closed under causation, which means that only 
physical properties have effects in the physical world, then you get a position mm -hmm. called epiphenomenalism, which is that consciousness is real, but has no effects in the physical world. Now, if you have that sort of view of consciousness, of qualia, then pretty obviously evolution couldn't select for them as such because evolution selects for things that are adaptive, that increase your fitness, your, um, your, your chances of passing on your genes to the next generation. And if consciousness doesn't have any effects, any effect, then it's not going to increase your fitness. It's not going to make you uh, a better, um, uh, uh, it's not going to increase your survival prospects. So evolution, evolution just, as it were, just doesn't see qualia. Evolution only sees, I mean, metaphorically sees, sees things that are beneficial for us or for our genes. I don't think. Uh, so it just wouldn't see qualia. It, you know, it's possible that it might see things that are correlated with qualia so that it, evolution selects for certain brain functions that just happen to bring qualia along with them as a kind of side effect. It could do that. But it couldn't select for qualia as such. Whereas it could very well select for the illusion of qualia, because that illusion might, as Nick explains, have all sorts of wonderful positive consequences for us. It might make us more, it might make us happier, it might make us more determined to survive, it might um, make us more cooperative and so on. So it could certainly select for the illusion of it, but it couldn't select for non physical properties as such. Right. Okay, that does make sense. And a lot of it seems tied to sensory states, I guess when we're talking about these, uh, these qualia mm -hmm. and trying to under interpret the sensory states um, in here. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if this is even still, I think you may have already covered all this several times in our conversation, but <laughs> talking about the evolution, you know, what do you think the, the mechanism is behind us experiencing these, these qualia and the emergence of, these illusions, the illusory, you know, qualia is, is if you looked at it, you know, from an evolutionary point of view to see, mm -hmm. you know, kind of how these came about and, and I, you know, the benefits obviously enriching our lives and, mm -hmm. and taking our own existence to that next level. But, mm -hmm. you know, evolutionarily, you know, what's kind of behind that? Well, um, as I said, I'm trying at the moment to sort of taxonomize, different illusionist positions. And I think one mm -hmm. big division uh, between them is between those that see the illusion as adaptive, like, like, like Humphrey does, uh, and having you know, positive benefits for us and it's been selected for and hardwired into right. our brains. And those who see it more as a, a side effect of other things, a side effect, say, of... So, and then that which is, I, I think is pretty much Dennett's position. So there the idea is what evolution has equipped us with is complex sensory systems, including systems of monitoring our own bodies. And it's equipped us with a certain level of introspection so that we can kind of monitor our own internal states and um, tell other people about it or not tell other people about it if we want to. Um, and as a side effect of that, we have this kind of illusion. So it's it evolution equipped us with, if you like, with the, with the, uh, the, the, the computer and it equipped us with the, the GUI interface for it. And then we made the mistake of taking the interface for something real. Yeah. Uh, but there's no particular benefits from treating the interface as real. It's quite, it's, you know, you, if we treated it just as an interface, just as a, a kind of an illusion, that would, we, it would do its job just as well. So, yeah, I think that's, we might that's even a, be happier. <laughs> uh, so, um, yes. And so, I think that's, that's, that's a big division. I don't really know which side I want to be on. I'm, I've always been very um, much of a disciple of, of Dennett's, and his position, I suppose, is more economical. If this just falls, if this illusion just falls out of um, uh, uh, processes that we already um, have reason to believe in, and it's just a kind of almost a philosophical mistake that we've made in, in reflecting on our own minds, then you know, that's kind of a simpler explanation. But I, I, do, yeah. also, I do also find Humphrey's account uh, quite, uh, it's, it's exciting and exhilarating, I think. Um, he, it, the perspective that he develops on this uh, is, is a really refreshing and, uh, one and a new one. And certainly when you're reading his book, it's, 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 it's a very persuasive book. I should say, yeah. actually, let me just add another thing here. Um, Please. The way that 
philosophers talk about consciousness and how we get into this problem is with the idea that we that qualia actually that word is a, is a tricky one sometimes it carries theoretical um connotations that that um, that aren't appropriate mm. but the idea that that phenomenal consciousness is a feature of our brain states that we can kind of introspect our our our, our our experiences and we notice these properties that they have these in, sort of internal properties it's a subjective private world but that in itself and that's supposed to be the the common sense view but it, but it isn't really um the common sense view i take it is that the qualities we are aware of are all out there in the world um when i'm seeing the blue sky i'm not really aware of blueness as a feature of my experience of the sky. I'm aware of blueness as a feature of the sky. Um, I'm, when I have a pain mm. in my shed, I don't think of this as being a feature of my mental state. I think of it as a feature of uh, as something that's happening down there in my shed. Right. Uh, so how do we get then to this idea that these qualitative um, uh, aspects of our experience are features of our minds rather than features of our bodies and of the world? And it seems to be because we did a bit of philosophy and we learned that really uh, things in the external world look different under different lighting conditions. They're different to different people. Um, you, can have an, uh, you can have the same experience when the thing isn't there. You can hallucinate and so on and so forth. You can have pains in phantom limbs and this sort of thing. So it seems that we, that was an illusion, that the blueness is out there in the sky. And now you could just stop there and say, well, look, it seems like there's this blueness out there. That's a kind of pure qualitative property that's kind of just out there spread out in front of me. But it's not really there. What there is out there is just the atmosphere and light being refracted through the water particles or whatever it is in the air. And that's all there is. And then there's it impinging on my retina and all kinds of processing happening. But we don't want to do that. We don't want to just say blue is an illusion. So if it's not really out there, but it is real, then where is it? Well, in our minds. And that's how we get to, um, to the problem of consciousness. Right. But of course, we could just stop at the first stage. We could just say, well, no, that, that, that is kind of illusory. The blueness of the sky is illusory. And it isn't, it's not really out there. And it's not anywhere else either. So that's another way of putting the illusionist perspective, if you like. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that's a good, that's a good, good analogy there. Um, so what uh, you mentioned breaking down the, you know, the, the taxonomy of, of illusionism, mm -hmm. and that's that that does sound pretty exciting to to get that done. Do you have mm -hmm. anything else in the future? I mean, I think that will probably keep you very occupied, but. Mm -hmm. Anything else that you want to want to share as far as your your future plans with illusionism or any other theories you're working on or predictions, books, collaborations? I mean, anything that you want to get out there? Well, uh, I'm working on various papers on this. Some in collaboration with people. I'm going over to um, to Paris next month to see Francois Camara for a conference. Um, he's one mm -hmm. of the he's, he's a young um, philosopher who's who's working on this agenda and they're doing some very interesting work. But ultimately this is building up to, um, to, to a book that I hope to start working on next year, which will draw on the various papers that I've done and will hopefully be a, a statement, I think, of the, the case for, illusion, for illusionism uh, response to the main reasons for rejecting it. And then a, this taxonomy that I've been talking about of different illusionist positions, whether I will actually find myself in that coming down in favor of a particular version of illusionism i'm not quite sure yet uh i have got some i feel that i'm swinging in certain directions but i'm not ready to uh, to to come out about that yet so but that's that's right. the that's the that's that will be the big statement of the of the um of the um some summary of the work that i've been doing so far and i hope that that if i can get it written next year it should be out the following year wonderful Wonderful. I will, uh, if I can impose upon your time again, I'd love to have you back and then talk about the book and some of the concepts in there. Well, I'd love to. Okay. 
All right, Dr. Frankish. Well, that's, uh, that's the end of, of the interview here. I just want to thank you for your time. It's been, uh, it's been wonderful talking to you about this, and you've obviously left me and hopefully all of our listeners a lot to think about with this. And I uh, just wanted to you know, tell you that I appreciate your time, and this has been fantastic. Well, thank you. I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you for inviting me. That concludes another edition of the Consciousness Podcast. Thanks again for listening. Please find us at Facebook at facebook.com slash the consciousness podcast at our Twitter handle at conchcast. And don't forget to subscribe to our feed at the consciousness podcast.com. Thank you for listening. But wait, there's more. Hang on for my far out question. That's good. Yeah. So let's, let's, let's just, let's just sort of, um, what's, what's, what's the word? Not brainstorm. Yeah. Brainstorm. Shoot the breeze. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> shoot the, shoot the breeze on this. It's, um, <laughs> Just a, it's a thought, and, and I'll tell you from my perspective coming from this, there's, there's all these different perspectives. You know, there's the, mm-hmm. the notion of a cosmic consciousness, or mm-hmm. when you look at, you know, dualism even, you know, that mm-hmm. the mind is separate from the body. Mm-hmm. And there are some people that, that believe, um, and in fact, the, the last person, um, Dr. Michael Nam, that I interviewed, his, his is going to go live tomorrow, but you know, he, he even is one who has the view that the brain is a filter, mm. that it filters out this larger, greater consciousness. Mm. And so that's what got me wondering if, you know, if the brain is this, this filter or a portal to a larger consciousness, you know, is, is the illusions that the brain is creating, you know, almost stuck in the middle, <laughs> you know, almost a, a middle functionality in between our physical neurons and this larger consciousness and without it if we didn't have these illusions that we would either go insane or be (laughs) amazing geniuses (laughs) i guess look the motivation for this sort of position is is to not have to kind of metaphysically inflate consciousness um, so if you if you start for, for the illusionist position, so if you start with a kind of metaphysically inflated view that the you know there is this cosmic consciousness or something like that, then you've really kind of no motivation for saying, but our consciousness is just an illusion. I mean, if you've gone for a cosmic consciousness, then why not you know let, let our consciousness just be part of it or something like that? Uh, it would be a bit like saying, look, everything that. Uh, people's experiences of the divine when they've had visions or seem to have uh, heard God speaking to them or whatever, all this can be explained in psychological terms. All the evidence for uh, 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 for the existence of God can be explained in, in psychological terms, but there still is a God. It would kind of seem mm. sort of superfluous. <laughs> so I suppose if illusionism is true, then you've no reason for positing a, a, a cosmic consciousness, if you like, that are no, psycholo- no reasons stemming from our psychology for positing a wider consciousness. Now, maybe, you, maybe there's some completely independent reasons. This is, I suppose, there might be independent reasons for, for believing in God. Um, but it would be kind of an odd position to be kind of really deflationary about our consciousness, yet kind of inflationary about the universe's consciousness, I suppose. Um, yeah. The, the, yeah, that the, makes the, sense. That makes sense, and you just ruined my fun. <laughs> the thing is, one, <laughs> one thing that well, <laughs> this is this is uh, it's just genuinely worrying me actually because I, I'm a materialist, I suppose, because I kind of don't want to, like, sort of give my I don't like want to go in for wishful thinking. I'm actually right. a material who kind of likes the idea that maybe there's a lot more to the universe than I, I don't know if I want this to go out actually. Um, yes, um, and the kind of material thinks it would be, and I think Humphrey uh, shares this, this, this feeling perhaps that um, it would be kind of nice if the universe were richer in these ways. Um, but I don't want to go in for wishful thinking. I don't want to believe in these things simply because I think it would be nice, which is why I want to explore the more mundane hypotheses. And I want to see what yeah. they can do. And only if they just didn't work out at all would I be prepared to go uh, to the more extravagant ones. But also, and I think this is something I, I, do, I do quite passionately believe in, I think that the material world is much richer than we tend to think. I mean, in a way, look, um, dualism 
dualism is the idea that we're not just made of matter or sort of mundane atoms and stuff, but we're made of some special stuff. Up at least our mm-hmm. minds made of some special stuff. We've got this soul stuff, whatever it is. Well, yeah, but would that make us any more special? Um, it's yes, we're, we're you know we're, we're not we're not kind of familiar with soul stuff in our daily lives, so it seems a bit special. But what would it? You know, it's just another kind of stuff, right? Um, what right. matters surely is what it does. If it's if 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 soul stuff gives us wonderful ideas and uh, uh, helps us to be artistically creative and to do all kinds of wonderful stuff, then great. But what if the brain, the physical brain, can do all that? Then it's just as magical as the soul stuff. If our yeah. brain can make us dream and uh, philosophize and create great works of art, if, the phys- if, if, if matter, co- suitably organized, organized in complex ways, can do all that, well, that's just as magical as any soul. Now, I suppose the, the thing that does attract people to the idea of the soul is the idea that it can survive. We, one thing that we know about matter is that it, you know, complex material structures tend to uh, decay, and certainly right. our bodies tend to decay. And the idea is that, well, if there was some special stuff, maybe this wouldn't, maybe this would survive. Well, first of all, I don't think that follows. How do we know that soul stuff doesn't decay? I mean, maybe that decays and maybe the soul uh, decays just like the body. Mm-hmm. Or equally, um, if you believe in God, uh, God could recreate a material body in an immaterial form or uh, well, even in a material form. We could, uh, so I don't think that just the, positing a different kind of stuff <laughs> sort of helps at all. It's what the stuff does that matters. If we are yeah. special, not because of what we're made of, because we're made of some, you know, we have this ingredient X that the rest of nature doesn't have. It's because of what we do, because of what we're, and if we can understand how we can do that through doing um, neuroscience and psychology, well, even more amazing. So I'm kind of, I like to sort of say that, yes, I'm a materialist, but matter is, is pretty magical itself. And I think that's a perspective that, that you'll find if you look at um, Nick's book, that's, very much a perspective that, that he has there. Yeah. Well, I, I say, actually, I think that's a very uh, uh, positive and optimistic <laughs> I view. Do, I, I'd also, I you think know, it's, it's, it feels good to, to think that we have all <laughs> that there and that it's creating these amazing experiences and, and that there yes. might even be more once we learn more about it. Absolutely. And also, one, one problem I think with, with this, another thing I, why I'm, one of the reasons why I'm wary about this kind of spiritual sort of dimension is that it tends to project everything forward. It's like surviving, uh, uh, surviving death, surviving forever is somehow going to increase our value. Well, I kind of think that our value is, is like in here and now and how we live now. And this moment, the moments that, that, that we are alive, these are part of the uh, space time. They're not going to be, as it were, erased. They, what I'm doing now, this, this moment, it's real, it's part of reality, it's part of the, the block universe, if you like, if you know that, that period of, 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 of time. And if I, you know, keeping doing it forever wouldn't somehow make it more valuable. Um, I, I, it's, you know, if, I, if, if, we, if, I, if we can't make a sort of impression in the few years that we're on Earth, then would we make an impression if we were living for a, a million years or for all eternity? Yeah. Now, do it now. Yeah, it feels uh, like it'd be uh, the opposite. It does, doesn't it? So, you know, and, and in a way, I think this, so this sort of materialist perspective for me, it actually makes us relish more what we have rather than trying to locate it in some other uh, dimension or some other material or something. You know, it's, it's, this is what we have, but it's, it's pretty amazing. And don't neglect how amazing and wonderful this moment and what we can do with this moment. Uh, don't neglect how amazing that is. Um, yeah. So that's, that's, you've got my sort of philosophy of life there. <laughs> yeah, I love it. It's, we, we've got this time here. Let's make the most of it and let's learn how we can make even more out of it by focusing in rather than projecting out into the future. Absolutely. And, 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 and similarly, I think that the, this is why I'm so excited about cognitive science. I mean, if you say that people say things like artificial intelligence, for instance, could never have the creative abilities that, that we have. Well, 
I don't know, maybe it could, maybe it couldn't. But isn't it a wonderful thing to try and explore and see if it could, see if we could? If you say, well, creative ability is just a kind of mysterious, spooky thing, and we can't explain it, and it's just a gift, and that's it, end of. Well, okay, so. But if you say, wow, well, maybe we can actually understand how it works. Maybe we can use our creative abilities to uncover the nature of cre cre creativity itself, and maybe even mm -hmm. artificially create it. Wouldn't that be, isn't that, doesn't that make the yeah. whole thing so much more fascinating and it, uh, there's now there's a whole realm for us to explore rather than just uh, uh, writing it off as something inexplicable. Yeah. Well, you sure do have some uh, amazing perspectives and ideas on this stuff. Ones, ones that I haven't heard or considered before. So um, I really appreciate that. You've, you've got me uh adding a whole new perspective to everything I'm trying to gather up here. Well, look, it's, it's, it's beloved. I, I had a look at your website, and so I have some idea of the, the background of, of why you're doing this, and I think what you're doing is a terrific thing, so you know, keep, it, keep at it. Well, thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Absolutely.